Today, I'm talking with Bob Galen. We talked about what he learned from being in the military, how being a role model influenced the people around him, and what the pandemic enabled for him. I'm Yves Hanul from Who's Agile. My pronouns are he and him. Welcome to my channel. You see a lot of Agilists around me on this screen. If you want to hear me interviewing, please click that subscribe button because these are the people that I've invited so far. If you think I'm missing people, let me know in the comments. And that like button, well, if you liked today's interview, don't forget to click it. Hello, hello everyone, and hello, Bob. Um, Hi, welcome. Yves. Thank you, thank you, I'm glad to be here. And here, let's, let's bring that also on the screen. For me here, that means I'm in Belgium and uh, in Ghent or Europe, and uh, let's go where you are, and that's all the way to the United States, and it's uh, in, the city is called Cary, is that correct? It's correct, it's Cary, North Carolina. And let's uh, bring you back on screen because that's cool. always a little bit nicer. Um, and on my side, it's uh, a little bit after seven o'clock and uh, in the evening. What's the time on your side? Uh, it's a little after 1 p.m., so right after lunch. Right after lunch. So that's a little bit why I'm, I'm, I'm asking to, to show the people here that, okay, this is how we're rolling these days over the Internet, uh, having... The idea is to have a kind of uh, a local chat, like we're sitting in a bar at a conference somewhere, but somehow both of us, well, at least I'm in my home, and I think you're in your home office, something like that as well. Correct. And we're having this conversation. And Bob, for the few people that don't know you, could you in, uh, introduce yourself a little bit? Who are you? Uh, I'm Bob Galen, everyone. Uh, I am an Agile coach. Independent. I'm an independent Agile coach, practitioner. Um, I started, I was interested in Agile in the late 90s, so maybe for the first 12, 15 years of that time, I was a leader in organizations, so a CTO or a VP of engineering and leading lo relatively large teams and experimenting with Agile in those contexts. Uh, and then around 2000, I incorporated, and I've been uh, independent since about 2012, 13. Uh, so I, my coaching interest is probably not generic training. So I'm not a trainer. I do some training, but I do more mm -hmm. coaching and I probably lean away from team coaching nowadays and more leadership coaching, organizational coaching. Sometimes people call it enterprise level coaching. Uh, I recently, I've written a few books, uh, self-published some of them. Uh, they've done relatively well. It's usually around a passion for me. I write with something that I'm passionate about. The latest one is something called Extraordinarily Badass Agile Coaching. I was uh, about to say that, that's, uh, and I heard already many people here on the show being very uh, positive about your books. Oh, that's that's nice to hear. You never know, Fred. You never you sort of let it you let it fly into the universe, and you're you're not quite sure what's going to happen. So, uh, so I'm I'm thankful for that. But that's that's something that I I published maybe a year and a half ago, uh, and that's a little and bit I'll, about me. I'll, I'll link the a link in the show notes to the book. Uh, I forgot to to add a, a picture of the book that I could show. Uh, I should have thought about that, but okay. Uh, things happen. Uh, but I'll definitely add a link in the show notes so that people uh, can learn about it. Because like I said, already few people here in the show really love that book. Uh, we're, we're very, it's, uh, I haven't fully read it. It's uh, on my link, uh, on my pile of books, let's put it like that. And I've actually already looked uh, here and there a little bit in it. Yep. Uh, and for me, it also feels like a book that uh, I'm, I, I probably won't read it cover to cover. It feels more like, okay, I will read a chapter, then think a little bit about it, and then some more. Is that is that a correct assumption? Or I, I think that's a fair... I mean, some people, Eves, do. Uh, I mean, more novice or... Uh, you know, early in their career, coaches are reading it. They're surprising me that people are like reading it two or three times and and, and they're highlighting things, which is nice, but it sort of scares me that I don't want them to take it too seriously <laughs> and control your life as a coach. Uh, but I, I think what you described is my own reading style. 
uh, for most most books, I'm a sampler. So I have, I probably have four to five to six books in flight at any one time. Um, mm-hmm. And I have a large backlog of books and I'll sample them. And depending on where I'm at, my context and what I'm getting from the book, I may read more thoroughly. I may go deeper uh, or or not, or I may revisit it later on as well. So I, I have that sort of a reading style. And so not surprising for for people who are I, in some ways who are similar um, that that's then also how I would read that I think I will read your book uh, because it's 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 very similar how I read books I love reading books but I usually read indeed well maybe not six but three four books at the same time uh, and for me a book is also not something I want to. Uh, fully, uh, I, there's never, almost never a book that I fully grasp and say, okay, I love everything. And most books is like here and there a little bit. Uh, I also don't think there's any book that I've totally not loved. There's always a little part that that, that I like, as, as well, yep. that, depending on, if it's totally not, I'm probably stopped before I read everything. Uh, but even there, books that are hard, I sometimes try to read multiple times uh, to see if there's a moment that, uh, that it, it fits better into my context. And usually I still indeed find a few nuggets in, in every book. And, and it seems that is a kind of similar style. And, and we jumped right into that already. Uh, and I think, yeah, in, in a lot of ways, we, we are similar and we, we know each other. So I want to go to that uh, very first question. What is something that people usually don't know about you that um, has influenced you in, in who you are? So there's maybe a few things. One, I was I was born uh, on a farm. I was born and raised on a dairy farm in wow. on the East Coast in central Pennsylvania. So in Pennsylvania, on the East Coast of the U.S., outside if anyone's ever heard of Philadelphia, so sort of an hour to an hour and a half west driving of Philadelphia in a place called Lancaster County, uh, which in the U.S. is Amish. There are there's Amish country. So that's one of the Mm -hmm. two or three uh, focused areas for the Amish. I'm not Amish, but I was as growing up, we were surrounded by Amish and Mennonites. So it was a wonderful way to learn. That's that's influenced my roots, I think. and I guess so, my so wait, just just to make sure I understand. So your family itself was not Amish, and and your your community also not. But in the cities around, or there were a lot of Amish people. Is that how should I correct. understand? Correct. Absolutely. Saying? In fact, we were we were Catholic. <laughs> so so we were one Catholic family surrounded by uh, all farmers. So we were all uh, mostly dairy farmers. Some folks mm-hmm. were re- raising steers. Uh, and some folks were, you know, raising different like vegetables and things like that. But it was all a, it was a farming community. So spread out. We had about 250 acres of land uh, that we wow. raised cows on. Uh, so that's one thing. And the work ethic. Another thing people I don't know about if they don't know is I didn't go to university out of high school. So I went into the military for three years. So I volunteered wow. to go into the military uh, and I did some uh, and it made an impression on me um, and I probably wasn't ready for it. I was a naive farm boy. Uh, and uh, so I had, and I went into the military and I didn't know what I was signing up for. Uh, and and, it was and when you say naive, is that because of movies or because of those totally books or completely not knowing anything? What did you expect? So I was isolated, you know, farm community. That was my, I looked at the world as the world is a, a larger farm community and that's not true. So for example, in the military, uh, they sent me to Thailand, for example. Uh, wow. I had never, this was right From after From a country Vietnam, boy to a completely to, different country. To a third world country, yeah. which culturally incredibly different and just dropped me in there and said, here, do do work, <laughs> be, be in the army. So, so that was, that was a culture shock to me a little bit. And what age were you at that time? I joined right out of, so 18, I joined the, the army wow. when I was 17. And so when I turned 18, I immediately went into the, to the army. It was, it was all volunteer. So it wasn't, it, it wasn't a, a prescripted, uh, 
military force. Like like during Vietnam, there was a draft. Mm. This was post Vietnam, right after. Uh, so I joined in seven, 1974, and Vietnam ended in seventy two. So so uh, Southeast Asia was still pretty volatile at that time, and and Americans were not. We were not friends. We didn't have a lot of friends in Southeast Asia. So uh, so, so that was part of the dynamic during the and time. And were you? aware about some of the things that happened in Vietnam? Because I mean, that was, if you look at it now, there's a lot of, yeah, a lot of things happened there. A lot of people protested. And, and were you as a 17, 8 year old, were you aware of some of these things that happened? Sure. Or were you, yeah. Okay. Sure. I mean, the, the ties, for example, kicked us out. So the ties, um, the U S military had bases in Thailand during the Vietnam war staging bases. Uh, I was in a base called Udon Thani, which was in the upper uh, eastern, northeastern corner of Thailand. So we were 20 miles from Vientiane, Laos. So up in that corner is Cambodia and Laos. And at that time, Cambodia and Laos were communist. And it was still and supporting Vietnam after the war. So there were still there were still guerrillas shooting at us. There was no war, but we were still not welcome. And then the Thai students uh, sort of, you know, just, you know, ran some protests and eventually the Thai government kicked us out while I was there. And I went to the Philippines for a little while and then I came back to the U.S. And I can imagine com as a completely different person because 18 is already a, a year. Well, it, at that age, I have children this age, so I know that this is very formative you you a lot of your ideas about the world are formed in that moment and then there you were in a completely different country that was hostile to you as a military because they saw you as well if i can put it bad a military a american military person yeah. Yeah. and you had no clue when you was where you were signed up for so that yeah. must have been really really hard as a as a as a young now, I think some of the good stuff, I, again, I don't know if you know much about the military, but it, and in the U.S., it's very organized. So, for example, mm -hmm. all of your clothes have to be folded in a certain way. So I had a footlocker and my socks would have to be rolled up, Eves. So they literally had to be there. There was only one way to organize your closet your shoes, your clothes. <laughs> and so and that's just an example of very and impressive that's, because that's typically what we see in in movies about training but that's also the same thing when you were deployed in in thailand or the philippines yeah. yes wow it's okay. so there's so there's this chaos but it also and and this resonated with me so i, I i'm mm. torn i really resonated with order i mm. resonated i was good at following orders uh and i didn't realize that before i went into the army for example, my son went into the military maybe a decade or so ago or two decades ago, and he didn't he could not handle being told what to do. And he literally left. And and for me, I saw sort of, at that point in my life, I resonated with prescriptive oh. leadership. Uh, and it, it I, I was in an honor guard, for example. I would dress up and march in parades. <laughs> and so that was part of that. So that was, I, that surprised me that, uh, you know, it, I guess it emerged the organizational part of me. That's why I like, pro traditionally, I liked project management. Mm. Uh, and I still, I still, and it's, it's sort of a, <laughs> it's a dissonance between that level of order and then agile. And it's it's mm. a bit of it is a, it's a bit of tension there that I I find it true to this day, and it's a healthy tension and, I think. And I can also imagine that everything that you did there, everything the army there, was a lot of chaos around you, and yes. did that order inside the way you had to handle things inside? Did that gave some kind of peace, some kind of uh, yeah. Yeah, it, I think it. I think you have to do that. You can't. That's part of the the military is to try to bring order, and it's to chaos because you can't predict. Mm -hmm. Like we would, we for example, we would have Laotian guerrillas that would sneak across the Thai border, and they would lob mortars at our base, and they would shoot at us. 
uh, randomly. It wasn't it wasn't a, an attack. It was harassment. But you can't. But that keeps you on your toes. It's hard to sleep. It's hard to it's hard to have peace when that's happening. So the order sort of offsets that a little bit, I think. And, mm. and you you can't just you when you're having those events around you, you need to be sort of you need to have some structure, I think. And that was the, what they were trying to do there. Not just with how we folded our clothes, but how we, for example, how we responded to attacks. It was very ordered uh, so that folks aren't running around. And I can also imagine, uh, I, I, I said that the other day, someone that is that when there is a lot of chaos happening, the way we react is, is sometimes, yeah, it, it tells a lot to people. But if you practice, for example, that's why they practice fire drills. So when there is chaos of a fire, you're, you have a structure and you know how to react. Is that kind of similar there? Is that the, the fact that everything is drilled, that there is structure? Is that helping to... to I, th I think that helps. Yes. I think that helps with that. I mean, mm -hmm. coming forward to today, one of the, one, one of the superpowers I get... I'm very interested in strengths-based sort of discovering my own strengths. And one of the strengths mm -hmm. or superpowers that people told me that I have is calmness under pressure. Um, now I, that's an external calmness. I'm not always internally calm, but I don't, I don't run around and overreact or overcompensate. Now I've grown in that over time. And I think folks, you know, if you become older, you, you, you can maybe sort of train yourself in that over time. But I, I, I look back at the military. There's not, much, there's not much you could do to me at this point of my life that's really going to get me to overreact. Oh, wow. Yeah. Mm. I, I, I get that. I, I, I think it's even somewhere on my LinkedIn that somebody said that Eve brings... Uh, peace at the moment that there is a lot of chaos and I bring um, well not chaos but I, I think I'm kind of tension when there is too much peace when it's when 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 people feel like okay when they actually need to worry a little more about quality or whatever I will bring that part in but if if all hell breaks loose then it doesn't help to start shouting and whatever no then you want peace and calm to make sure that yep. okay yep. we deal with the problem and that's a little bit what I'm hearing and in that sense I want to I want to make that link back to Agile because I think Agile, although we're working in chaos and we're working in, 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 in a very uh, situational where a lot of things happen, at the same time, I think there's a lot of order. The way, the way we want to deal with stuff, the way we want, okay, we have, I don't know, dailies, but we also have uh, ways to deal with quality, with unit tests and all that kind of stuff. Is that I see it as a kind of, Structure bringing. Do you see something similar, or do you see a difference? I I do. I I don't know. I think there's. I'm going to use the term tactical and strategic structure. I think mm. what you were talking about is tactical structure or execution based structure, and I think that helps. I think maybe an even more important thing is what I think of as strategic or mindset, like the presence. One of the things I I think about a lot in coaching in agile coaching or just coaching in general is how we show up uh, mm -hmm. you were talking about it earlier i think is, and it's not just showing up with kindness or calmness it's how we show up situationally like the presence are we being in the moment mm -hmm. and and uh and have and people feeding off of that i think in terms of how we can be an anchor and we can be an influencer to the ecosystem around us and how and how we show up. So I, I think in Agile, the structures help with that. But there's this notion of Agile mindset, and it's a fuzzy thing. And people, you know, what does that mean? To me, one of the aspects of that is is my presence. It, being mm -hmm. self-aware of my presence or being intentional in how I'm showing up situationally. And I think that makes a difference as well. Both of them make a difference. Yeah, I, I get that. And it's that it's a little bit that part about, okay, well, the more you're grounded and the more we, or sometimes practice, because it's, it, yeah, if, if all hell breaks loose, but if you've thought about before about hell that can break loose, it, for me, at least it brings much more peace and I can bring the peace to other people. And, and if you're running into a chaos situation and you didn't think about it before, I would be in chaos as well, and that wouldn't help teams. I would think. That's, right. Uh, that's uh, yeah. I I think there I see a lot of similarities there. 
Okay, I want to, to move to that uh, next question that if you would not have been doing what, uh, what you've been doing now, do you have any idea what could have become of you? Was there anything that you were destined to become or? You know, it's, I saw that question on, you know, you have a list of questions and, and I reviewed it. I wasn't trying to, I sort of was reviewing it to get my head around them. Mm -hmm. And this was one that I hadn't thought about and it made me think, um, I don't know if I, I, there, I did not have a destiny. So one, mm -hmm. two, I know, I know that the military was not my destiny. So, so a short period of time was, was good enough for me. Uh, I think where I would have landed is something mechanical is the way I think of it. And what I mean by that is like carpentry, building things with my yeah. hands. There's, I, I get some joy in, in this notion of craftsmanship uh, or building. And I think wood is something that I enjoy a lot. So either carpentry or woodworking is probably where I would have ended up. Now, I didn't, you know, I, I did some of that in, in high school. Yeah. But uh, and then I just left it behind. Now, on the farm, on a farm, you are inherently mechanical. If a tractor mm. breaks, you don't call up a repair shop. You <laughs> you fix it. If some if if a piece of if a fence breaks, you fix it. So mm. that's just, now if you can't fix it, you might ask someone for help. Uh, but, if, you know, you're self-sufficient on the farm, which I like that. Uh, and you're and, very, and go ahead. And I want to add, add a little bit of what you said earlier on. You said about if you can't fix it, you still ask for help. But in my mind, you also look there and you make sure that the next time maybe you're able to fix it yourself. That's how that, I see it on a farm. Is that correct? Absolutely. I mean, that's that's the nature of it. Because things break all the time in unexpected ways. And you get very creative. It's not just fixing it. What if a tractor... Like we had tractors ease that would fall over. They were three wheel tractors, two wheels in the back, one wheel in the front. And I was an experimenter as a child. So I would try to drive the tractor on hills to see what would be the angle that it would That's stay upright. And then what would be the angle that it would fall over? That wasn't my intent. But I was experimenting, and my and my it drove my father crazy because he's like, "Oh, you you." There he goes it. again. <laughs> there he goes again, and we'd have to get pulleys and crank the tra we'd have to crank the tractor back up again. So so things happen, and and you get pretty resilient about doing that uh, and working with your hands. Uh, one of the I don't do that that much I didn't do that much in software I mean I always mm -hmm. felt that software development was a craft but it mm -hmm. wasn't the tactile it it, it mm -hmm. I've not done the tactical hands-on stuff since then and that's probably where I would have ended up hmm. but but uh, because you before you also talked about Amish and, and Amish for me are also very practical doing everything themselves a lot of woodwork, at least that's how it looks in the into the movies. I've never encountered them myself, so I well, because yeah, but but uh, that's how it sounded. It, did that that was an influence, or is that just coincidental? No, no. I mean, it's I mean a lightweight influence. Yes, the surroundings. Amish. I don't know. So it's not just woodworking, but there's this mm -hmm. notion of craft. Uh, in in the U.S., there's a shaker. There's a style of furniture building which is called Shaker. Uh, and it's the Shakers were in New England. They were a religious group. And they built very simple lined furniture, but it was very well crafted. It, last, it has lasted for hundreds of years, examples of it. Uh, and Amish furniture, Amish buildings, uh, you've probably seen in the movies, a barn raising, mm -hmm. where, exactly. where a community will raise a barn in literally a day or two. And it's not, it, it is not, are, it's not poorly crafted. It's actually a very, very, very well-crafted barn. So craft is incredibly important. Well, you know, smooth joints, well-framed joints, sturdiness is part of that craftsmanship. And that stuck with me. I think that's one of the reasons why Agile, one of the tenants when I coach Agile teams, I'm trying to influence them to think about craftsmanship. Uh, passion and craftsmanship and thinking about doing things well uh, to stand the test of time. That's I'm not gold plating, not perfectionism, 
but really being proud of the craft of software. And that comes directly from my my farming background and, and the woodworking background. It's interesting because I've never thought about craftsmanship and, and gold plating as, as yeah, I, 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 I can see the difference, but I've never seen the link also between what you just described about the Amish. And it, it's interesting because indeed, when you see them putting up a barn in a movie, it, it looks like this is, yeah, indeed the crafts really done well. And at the same time, not gold plating like, okay, this is just, that's the, the um, what is it? The purpose of that barn is doing this and that's what it is and nothing, nothing else, nothing fancy, nothing, but at Very, the same time yeah. quality that probably doesn't need much of repair. And even if it needs repair, it's very yeah clear what needs to happen and, and to, to make it last for another hundred years or whatever. That they Absolutely. Want That's a, a very interesting way to think about software again. So thank you for that uh, that observation. It, it's something that I didn't see, but it, it I think, or at least I hope it will inspire some other people. I know for me, it will inspire me if I want to talk about metaphors for quality. It's definitely something uh, because I see that a lot in the tension when we teach agile is we want to when when we talk about quality that people then are worried about the gold plating part but actually right. no it, that's not there it's it's almost the opposite it's making sure that we build the just enough features with the the best quality what the good quality but nothing more um, that's exactly almost the opposite of, of gold plating I would say. So thanks for sharing that. You're welcome. Let's move to that uh, third question. What do you consider uh, your biggest challenge, at least the biggest one, of course, that you want to share on the internet? And, and why is that a good thing? I I think it's a good thing. It, it could be. It, it, we'll see. But right now, I'm, I'm moving in my life. My biggest challenge is moving into what I call semi-retirement. So I'm moving from being much more active and public speaking and flying around or doing a lot of work to I've officially in the U.S. I'm officially collecting Social Security. I'm officially uh, under Medicare. I am 66 mm -hmm. years old. So I for all from a government perspective, I'm retired from a Bob Galen point of view. I don't want to totally stop. And, and I, I have the privilege of what I do, I can sustain and I can just sort of part, do more, less, you know, less hours and I can part time and I can narrow it. But navigating that, navigating from a full time consultant or a coach uh, and navigating that into how do I say no? Uh, mm. How do I reduce the interest? We were talking about the book earlier. The good news is I wrote a book. The bad news is people were asking me about coaching <laughs> advice all the time, and and I want to respond, and I have a hard time saying no. So, mm -hmm. it's it's causing me to rethink everything. I'm I'm rethink my priorities, rethink uh, my balance with my family, um, mm -hmm. rethink uh, you know how I'm pivoting. Uh, what am I going to focus on? Uh, Years ago, I was a more general, I was a generalist. I thought of myself as a general coach. I never met a, a client that I would say no to. So there, mm -hmm. I, there was, I would try to do everything. So to me, that's a generalist view. Nowadays, I'm much more sort of a specialist view or a boutique mm -hmm. coach, uh, which I'm focusing on coaching, for example, coaching coaches. And that's a narrower focus. So making that transition is part of that. So I, that's a challenge for me. Uh, it's a challenge for me to, because I'm so passionate. I mean, my work is really my, people ask me, what is my hobby? And I'm almost embarrassed to tell them my, my, I do some gardening and I do some, I do some things around the house, but essentially my hobby is my work. I love my work. I love what I do. Uh, but, but again, it's how do I, how do I control that and make sure that I'm, I'm sort of winnowing things down and really, I think a lot, Eves, of my legacy. So it's important mm. for me. I think about what am I leaving behind? And that's another part of this pivot is 
for example, diversity and inclusion. I'm trying to get involved in causes that I believe in more because I have privilege. So part of my pivot is changing, changing what I'm investing my privilege in and, and how am I making a difference? Uh, I think about that much more than I used to. So that's, that's a challenge for me. Uh, it's good for me. I think it's good for any agilist to, we have to navigate through that, through change, uh, through discovery, through experimentation, uh, self-awareness is part of it. Uh, so, but, but I'm still in the middle of that. And if you, if you ask my wife how well I'm doing, she would probably have a different opinion <laughs> than how I am doing. So, uh, so, so, so it just depends on your perspective. I'll, I'll schedule a talk with her next week and then we'll see about that. I would, yes, I would really appreciate that. <laughs> I'll ask her what's your biggest challenge. And yeah, exactly. and I'm sure you'll get a list. Uh, so. um, but I like also your humor in that. But yeah, it's um, I, I recognize a lot of that. Um, and at the same time also, well, you do have a lot of knowledge. You do have, like you say, in the book, like many people, like I said earlier, are really fan of, of the book. So there's a lot of knowledge. And I can imagine I have similar kind of things. And I think a lot of us coaches, we are there to help the world and to help other people. And so you have that knowledge and then people ask you something and you know you can help them. And uh, yeah, still no, I said that I was going to do something else. That's a, exactly. That, yeah, that, that, that's the kind of challenge. And at the same time, I recognize also why it's a good thing, because like you said, you're semi-retired, so you're trying to wind down, you're trying to be much more available for your family. Um, and, and so that, that I can definitely see why you consider that as a good thing. Um, but like... Well, I think with many good things, it, it's sometimes hard and, and finding a good balance. Um, is it? And I, I want to ask a little bit because we're now, we're recording this in 2023. So this is three, day, three years after the pandemic. Did that uh, influence your decision? And because you were then already uh, in your 60s when the pandemic hit, was that something that made you think about that or is that unrelated? I, I, I don't think it made me think about it. I, mm. I think of the pandemic as actually enabling it to some degree mm. um, because pre-pandemic, all of my coaching required travel or 90% plus of my coaching and training was per face to face. And, and it really wasn't popular. It was hard for me to sell coaching and training that was virtual or remote. Every client wanted it, me to go to them uh, yeah. in one way or the other. Now, maybe they would distribute the training to other sites, but it would I would be facing one group. And then the pandemic changed everything about virtual delivery and virtual interaction. Uh, so coming out of that, uh, it's, it's actually made it easier for me to have a smoother glide path, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I think yeah, because then you can say, okay, I take one thing, maybe an hour or two. You would never fly out to a client just for one hour. You would then exactly. be there a day or two or a week, maybe. Yeah. Exactly. So, so that's. I, I mean, I think if the pandemic wouldn't have occurred, I would have had a very abrupt stop working because travel was required, um, mm -hmm. and I don't know how I would have navigated that. That I may have. I may have continued on for a longer period of time and not, I don't know, but the pandemic in, in that way has really been a blessing for me. For, I think for a lot of, of folks that do what we do, because now we have viability in virtual interaction and virtual coaching. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, Liz Atkins was here on the show saying something similar. She said, like, it's not like I don't want to go to clients, but they now have to prove to her why it's valued of her time to be away from her family, to get on the plane and, and stay for a few days or whatever. And it's like she says, I still do it, but I, I think much more about it. And clients really have to prove in a way that that it, it makes sense. And for some of things... Yeah, for example, I think all of us, we sometimes do a one or two hour keynote kind of thing for a company. Would we really fly to to there for, yeah, spend that time for maybe one hour talk and then an hour or two after talk? Mm, kind of feels uh, exactly. very expensive on our family time, on the environment, even for us. That's, yeah, it's, um, 
I, I think you, you're really right. And of course, that doesn't mean that we say that the pandemic is really good. There was a lot of bad things no. about that. But there are some upsides for, for many people around it as well that are not always stressed enough, I think. That's, that's very good to, to, yeah, to also show it to people like other than all the negative parts, it, it did give some advantages to, to, to some people, at least to you. Uh, that's what I'm hearing. And indeed, a few others said some similar things. What was I want the disruption? To... Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. What, what's the disruption? What do you say? I was going to say it's a, it was a disruption in thinking, too. So, mm. for example, all of my training before the pandemic was face-to-face -face training. What the mm. pandemic did is disrupted me and forced me to, to become better skilled at virtual training. Uh, the same thing with coaching. It disrupted me and forced me to think about and consider and refine my skills with virtual coaching. So it, it just didn't happen. And this happened with organizations, tools, tools, emergence of various tools, the usage of those tools, just becoming more skilled and creating a, you know, a virtual ecosystem for whatever we're doing. So uh, and now that that has sustained. So it wasn't easy. Like I'm a dinosaur, so it's not it was not easy for me to make that, or as easy for me to make that pivot. Uh, but but I feel I feel good about making that pivot. And and what I, for example, in some of my training classes, I actually think the virtual delivery is better, equal to or better than the face to face delivery in some cases. So mm -hmm. the quality, the interactions, they're very different, and in many cases, the outcomes are better. So. Uh, yeah, uh, that's something I heard before, and it, it, I think it depends a little bit on the audience. If there's a lot of extroverts, they might maybe prefer more the face-to-face, the -face. but I hear at least uh, a lot of introverts saying, well, it gives some advantages of doing sit remote training. So there is a part of the audience that we didn't reach as well before, uh, and I think that's, that's a really important thing. And this is the interesting thing. We're, we're in, out in the industry that is about changing the world. Agile is about helping yep. people adapt. And there we were not that well adapting to a remote environment because a lot of Agilists have been saying for a lot of years, that doesn't work. Uh, you need to do yep. And the pandemic forced us to read think it and to re to show us like oh maybe we're indeed the dinosaurs that don't want to change and the world has moved on and uh, the pandemic kind of forced us to to catch up with it Let, let's put I, it that way i agree so uh, even there i think that's so and that sense that's good as well okay let's move to that next question and you kind of said it already a little bit before you're you're driven you have a lot of passion and that's also how i think you are known in the agile community as a person who's very driven but do you know where that drive where that passion is coming from i don't know i mean um i think maybe it's so i was talking about legacy mm -hmm. so for whatever reason in the last 10 years, I've been thinking more and more. So in, let's say, the first 20 years of my career, I wasn't thinking about legacy or privilege or what am I leaving behind or making a difference. And age is something to do with it. The personal realization that I am gaining in privilege, I have something to offer. Um, and... And I maybe the intent of trying to do something. So I have a choice of do I keep it? <laughs> do I keep it to myself or do I give it uh, mm -hmm. freely? Um, an another part of it is uh, years ago, there's, there's a test consultant. I think it was James Bach who shared this with me. It may have been someone else. But James was, we were talking about, do you sell your intellectual property, what you learn? Or do you give it away as a consultant? How much do you sell or monetize and how much do you give away? And very early in my career as an independent, an employee, but also doing independent work, I tried to sell and monetize everything. So if I gave you a sentence, Eve, in an email, if I answered one question, I would try to monetize that in some way and like send me a dime, send me a quarter, Eve, please. Uh, so I was very monetization and and i was early in my career so that that's not it that was important right generating revenue was was a, important but then i shifted to 
being less focused on that and being mo more focused on giving ideas away and and then the universe there's this notion that the universe will pay you back you will right it's you will you will reap what you sow you will the universe will acknowledge that and i started and that started building my practice that that pivot I noticed it had a business dynamics, it had learning dynamics, it had networking dynamics, et cetera, associated with it. And I think it's just towards the end, I'm not trying to sound ominous, but towards the end of my career, I'm, I'm, I'm leaning into that, that notion of I have privilege, I've gained privilege and I wanna share it. For example, I like inviting people to co-present with me, if that makes sense. I'm speaking mm. at the uh, Agile Conference in Orlando next week. And I invited a young lady to co-present with me. And I felt that, and this is a first for her, and but I felt that, that she deserved a stage. She deserved, she has a voice that really, I wanted to give her an opportunity. And I look at it partly as sharing privilege uh, and giving her that opportunity. And I've done that quite a few times before. So that's the thing. When I say legacy, it's sharing privilege. Uh, it's helping others. And that gives me a lot of joy. Uh, and it, there's a return on investment in my practice, I think. Uh, that's less interesting to me, but it just gives me joy to see other people sort of mm. rise. Rise. What can I do? What can I do to help people rise? Uh, and it's not about me. It's about them. But what can I do to just spark, just to set up sparks? But that's probably now where my passion is. Uh, I don't always see it. It's actually why I write. I, I don't know if you know, mm. but I... I write, I write way too many words. So I, I, I think I, most people do. <laughs> so I write a lot. And one of the drivers for me is what can I put out there to help someone? I don't know who, but what can I, can I share an experience? Can I share an idea? Uh, can I make light of something, a situation and to help, you know, improve the world of work, improve the world about, improve the world in general. So I now I know that may sound odd, but that's that's where my passion is now, and I'm and 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 I'm trying very hard. It's I'm not perfect at it. There's no recipe, but I'm, you know, until I stop, I want to do I want to do everything I can to sort of give back. Maybe that's the way. Uh, I'm passionate about giving back to the community that has given so much to me. I recognize so many things that you say. Also, the first part that you said about about the money part is like when you start out as a consultant, I did some similar things like, well, the, this series grew out of a book and that book grew out of a, a blog that was first completely for free on my blog. And then I was like, oh, maybe I, sh I was looking for content to turn into a book. At the beginning, that book was free. And then other people, consultants around me said, you're stupid to give it away. You should ask some money. And so I'm, I'm like, yeah, OK, I'm, I'm a consultant. I, I'm, I'm an independent. I should ask some money. And then gradually it's like, yeah, but wait a minute. This is so much about community. Let's let's scale back that and and then turning it into a video that's now completely free. It's like that. I think that's a lot of us consultants. We're looking for what is the right balance. It's like okay, giving it something, see, seeing return. I also the the, the second part for me. Uh, I learn most. Well, when I read a book, when I read something, I learn most if I teach it because then, then I'm, I'm, I'm learning it at a deeper level. So the people to who I'm teaching are, are asking me some questions. So I learn at a deeper level. But then when I start pairing with someone else on teaching it, I learn even more. And, and yeah, in the beginning, it was very tempting to say, okay, I'll ask some, some of the other friends that are already there and that are at maybe my level or a little bit higher and I'll learn from it. And actually... The last couple of years, I do the exact opposite. I'm either teaching, co-teaching, or pairing with my children because that's that's a nice way to again to have that work-life balance. Or, like you say, uh, I actually know when I go to a conference these days, I'm I'm actually proposing something alone, and then I'm asking the organizers, okay, is there someone else in your community that knows something about that topic that we can pair up and we can do things together? Like you say, I typically give someone else a stage, but at the same time, it's learning, it's learning about, well, from that person, but it's also learning that person about how do you practice a workshop? How do you prepare something? Uh, and 
I'm not sure. I, I, I think in most of these cases, I actually get more out of that than, than if I would do it alone. Yep. But it's also about sharing the stage and indeed sharing that privilege. Um, it's, it's, yeah, it, it, it's the kind of thing that a lot more people should do, I think. I agree. I resonate with you. It's the un, I think there's the hidden secret. Uh, and, and I've said this, it's not such, such a secret or it's not so hidden. But I, when I do a lot of pro bono coaching and people ask me, well, why do you do that? I coach coaches. And I'm like, I always get something from a coaching session. Always, mm -hmm. always, always. I, I host a lean coffee called the Agile Moose. I've been doing that through COVID as a place, just a gathering place for people, a safe gathering place. And why do you do that? Because every time I attend the herd, something I get something, I get an idea or I get, or I'm down and I get picked up in some way, or I get something from it. And it's the same thing with the presentations. Uh, mm -hmm. I, it's, it's always, I always learn. Now you have to, I have to pay attention to the learning. I can't be full of my own self, my ego, but if I'm paying attention, I'm always gaining something from those. Mm. Uh, and it's and, always valuable. And I want to, to add also a little bit like what you said before or link it to something you said before is that we have that privilege. Uh, I'm, I'm not, well, I'm, I'm, I'm 52, so not that the same age of you, but still, I'm a lot older. We're a lot older than, than 20 or 30 years old, and they cannot do all these things for free because they still need to do and, and have the money. It's not that we're rich and we don't need anything anymore, or at least not for me. I don't know for you, but I think both of us, we can still right. use some extra. We're, 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 so, but it still is a lot more privileged, and we can, we can deal with that. And it, or uh, let, let me rephrase it. It's easier for us to deal with that and do some pro bono work than some other people. Uh, Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, that's, that's what I'm talking about. We've gained, we've gained that over, over mm -hmm. time. Uh, someone, someone told me, I, I mean, this is a privileged conversation, but I remember I was coaching, I was giving someone advice. I was coaching an organization and there was a coach in an organization and, uh, and they were asking me about a situation and I gave them some advice and I had actually behaved whatever way in the organizational context. And, and they came back to me and we were sitting over coffee and they're like, boy, that was, you know, do you know that that's easy for Bob Galen to do that? It's so much easier for you to do what you just gave me advice for than me. And I, and I was like, you're right. I have the privilege mm -hmm. of, it's not just age. It's my experience. It's my gravitas. It's my legacy, whatever. It's, it's the organization's perception of me is not the same. And I, and I, I remember that event all the time to remind me that, that to, to be aware of someone else's, to be aware of my privilege and to be aware of everyone's context. What's easy for me is not easy for other folks. Right. For a variety of reasons. And it's just it's and that's what I mean. And then what can I do to make it easier for them? <laughs> and so, yeah. yeah. But, but the fact that we're saying it to an organization, what someone else, an internal might not be able to say, it's also helping them. Sometimes they, they don't like it. Sometimes it's like, yeah, but I've been saying it for five years. Yes, I know. And, and it doesn't make you happy that they listen to me, but at least you get your problem solved. So. Exactly. I can help you in, in, in that kind of way. And that's, that's how we, 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 yeah, we do what we do, I would say. That, yeah, I, I recognize so much of these kind of situations. And, and that kind of, uh, it, it's kind of the opposite. And at the same time, it's the same thing. What do you consider your, your biggest achievement? What do you consider, if you're talking about all these kind of things, what is for, for you, Bob, the, your biggest achievement? At least the biggest achievement so far, because... We hope that there still are some achievements on, along do. the way, I would say. I, I do as well. Um, I think twofold, Eves. One is my family. So I have I'm, I, I have four children. Uh, we, we, I was divorced when they were young. So around when they were like five to nine or ten, uh, I got divorced from my first wife. Uh, and it was a messy divorce. 
Uh, mm -hmm. And it was, and it continued to be messy until now. My children are grown. My my youngest daughter now is going to turn forty in December. She doesn't want to acknowledge that, but my youngest. So in December, at the end of December, all of my children will be forty or over. <laughs> so to wow. give you to give you uh, all, so all four of them. Uh, and I think it's staying the course, being a good role model, being a part time father is really was challenging for me. Still being a father, but doing it in a part time way, seeing how my children are resilient and I could infl I had some influence over them and how they developed as as humans and as adults and people. Uh, so I'm I th that's one of my biggest achievements is just navigating that what I consider a very rocky path uh, over time, over, you know, decades, basically. Uh, I, I really I, want to stress out a little bit because what you said is the end result you're really happy about, but the path is like anything we do in life is rocky and it's been messy. Yeah. And so, so you're not, you don't, you're not really proud about the path, I would say, or about the achievement is not the path that you followed, but more that with whatever you did, in the end result, it still kind of worked out for for these four people. I would say that. I'd I'd say I I like if I had a spirit animal, uh, an internal Bob Galen spirit animal, it would be something like a very tough animal, like a badger, or something wow. that would or something that wouldn't let go of a bone. You know what I mean? Something mm -hmm. that that. So I'm very I'm very persistent. I'm not the smartest coach in the world. I'm not the strongest coach in the world. But I'll, there's that notion of outworking you, if that makes sense, or out persisting mm. you. I'm, I'm dogged, if you will, and very persistent and patient. Uh, and and that was the way I. And you see results. I've seen results with my. And I'm, and I'm. I think that's one of my biggest achievements is my family. The other thing but is I can I... also wait. Can can I say so a little yes, bit? Yes, of course. It? I can also imagine that for teenagers having such a father, that's probably not easy because you are persistent in whatever you're saying. Is that <laughs> the correct have... way to see that? I I think so. I mean, I mean, again, it's not dogged; it's consistent. So, mm -hmm. what? So, I, for example, I was a very consistent role model. Uh, my my ex-wife she had some sort of um, some challenges health challenges or mental capacity challenges which affected the way the children were raised up so i was i was the anchor for my children if you will mm. now i was i could be uh, overly disciplined or overly you know hard not harsh but you know sort of high expectations but being very dogged but what i've seen is the children have appreciated that l later they had an anchor of consistency. Uh, they had an anchor of a role model who they could they could hold on to. Uh, and and that um, I think that's one of my great accomplishments is me plus you know being steady because it, it could have been easy for me to not be steady. Uh, mm. Now that same thing I bring to agile I think um, in that. And, and I don't know if it goes back to my that superpower we were talking about, you know, but I, I think I've stayed the course over a long period of time. So 20 years ago, I was just agile Bob Galen. So we, I didn't have much privilege, et cetera. But I think if you stay the course, if you follow the principles, continuous learning, walking your talk, and if you stay that course over time, the same thing emerges. You, you emerge and you develop yourself. You, you become a better coach. You become a better human. Uh, and, and you reap the results of that in the clients that you're contacting, the people that you're touching, if that makes sense, right? It's, it's not a one-year thing. It's a 20, I mean, it's a 25-year journey for me. And it would have been yeah, easy. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, I wanted to say, and maybe you wanted to say the same thing. It could have been easy to just uh, 20 years do the same year of coaching, but I, I hear that you know no you you re you, how the how what I want to say you you kept working on yourself you kept applying the same principles to yourself and you kept growing as, as so the Bob that I'm talking now now is not the same one as I talked about 20 years ago I would say absolutely I have a 
I hope it's a funny, quick story to share with you. Uh, a few years ago, I signed up. ORSC is a, a professional coaching program, mm -hmm. organizational relationship systems coaching. And I took it pre-COVID. So I went through, a, it's a five class series. So what was that, 2018-19? Uh, and I, I signed up for the classes and I remember when I signed up, I was talking to my wife and, and I had already signed up. And, uh, so I didn't ask my product owner for permission and I should have, I should have vetted it with my product owner because it was about, it was about, I don't know, the, the entire program with certification was maybe 25, $30,000. So it was a, to me, it was a significant amount, amount of training. And actually um, also as an independent that you had to do. And so the the rest of the team might have suffered from it. Uh, exactly. Yes. Yeah. So and I remember I was in the kitchen, we were talking. And I'm like, oh, and I I was trying to explain to her. And she's like, Bob, aren't you a coach? And I'm like, yes. And you're pretty successful, right? Like people pay you lots of money to coach them. Yeah. And they've been doing that for... For, for a Many long time years. yeah and she's like so so, so why she's like, do you still need it <laughs> so she's like why do you still need it and then she asked the most interesting question to me eves and she's like and do you think you have enough time to get a return on investment for <laughs> Hmm. <laughs> that kind of amount of money okay <laughs> that kind of money and and so and i i left i had to chuckle i'm like well you know fingers <laughs> crossed i can live a little a few more years and anyway, i can get an roi but but it it strikes me you know i do i try to i try to practice what i preach uh you know it's continuous learning not at a, in i'm curious about it i was curious it was a weakness for me it was an area that I needed to work on in my coaching, and I wanted to attack that. Uh, and uh, I think that's important. So that, that from an agile is staying, what I think of as staying the course. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing is I've, I've gotten criticized a lot over time. So I'll give you a quick example of that. Um, maybe around 2008, I was early in my career, and I was doing some conference talks and I, I talked about um, hardening sprints. I don't know if you've ever heard the term hardening mm -hmm. sprint, but I, I was talking about contextual hardening sprints at a, at a conference here in the U.S., like a nationwide conference. And it turned out that it got back to someone from Europe who was a trainer, a scrum trainer, heard from a client who attended my workshop and brought it to them. And then they escalated it to Ken Schwaber, uh, and, and Schwaber had an attorney contact me with a cease and desist proposition wow. to, and now I'm laughing about it, but at the time I, I was young and, and I was like, I thought, I thought I would have to drop something that I'm really passionate about. So along, this is probably the most extreme example. I'm like, I was telling my wife again, I was like, honey, it's like God is telling me that I misinterpreted the Bible. Wow. And, and I'm, I mean, at the time I was like, Schwaber was, was really one of the leads uh, in that community. And I'm like, gosh, I, I didn't say, I didn't say do not scrum. I, I talked about a technique in context and I was very mm -hmm. careful about that. I found some use in hardening. Uh, and I couched it, but, but again, I almost left the actual community. Then I got, I was, wow. I was so disappointed and I was just so anxious about maybe this isn't for me, but I stayed the course is what I'm saying. I stayed the course. And now I think if Schwaber sent me something like that, I would have a different, I would have a different, different reaction. reaction, a totally different reaction, uh, not in a bad way, but a totally different reaction. So it hasn't been, and you probably, can, it's not always easy. The paths mm -hmm. are not always that, are, they're not gold paths. It's, there's challenges along the way. And, and probably just for his defense, probably, Schwaber would react in a different way also now Absolute, with everything. Absolutely. With absolutely. So that, uh, because so, you, you're talking about being young, but 
at the same time, although officially Scrum started like 10 years earlier or 12 years earlier, 1996, when depending on what document you read and what thing you, you follow. But still, um, I think in 2006, 2008, it really was the, the upcoming thing. Absolutely. Extreme programming was still much more popular back then than, than it is now. Yeah. Um, and so I understand that a, a little bit like, okay, they want to defend their, yeah, their, their framework and they want to defend the name and everything that is there. So I think from that point of view, I might understand that, which is totally different these days. Of course, they might defend it in other kind of ways. Um, but, but yeah, it, it's, we're all learning at the same time, I think. Uh, well, it's, so but there's a, I don't know if you look on LinkedIn, there's a lot of contention. There's a lot of framework fighting and battling and things and i'm not that's not the point i'm just it's not an easy road and i think finding your way resilience and consistency is something at least for me and i think for many uh i mean you strike you've struck me as someone who's resilient you know consistently i it's called i call it sometimes fighting the good fight but it's not a fight but but mm. consistently walking that walk and and I and I I'm proud of that achievement. And you should. And and at the same time, like you say, it, it is hard. And sometimes we we miss a little bit in one way, but then we we find the, the path again. And it's very tempting. I don't want to go too much into detail, but all the fights that we see indeed on LinkedIn, it's very tempting because there's always something, always an opinion that we have, and and there is always somebody wrong on the internet, and and we are smarter and whatever. And depending on how much coffee and how much sleep we have, we go into these fights and and. Yeah, so, exactly. or how bad a client was in the morning or whatever, or yeah. let's also face it, the discussion we had at home with our partner that maybe and ended up reacting in some kind of ways. And I think it's, it's, it's important that we all indeed stay that fight and that we realize that, wait a minute, yeah, there might be something wrong, but there's also maybe some good things. And how could we support the whole good about these things? I think that, right. is, that is indeed the important part um and and yeah and that kind of brings me in in a way to uh to that next question about is there a personal agility that, because you already shared some ways of, of doing and things that were important do you have another tip for for the people here about yeah that you want to share the thing that i've discovered for me and i don't know where it came from i don't know how i happened on it it's sort of i think it's related to my introversion is i I continuously reflect. I think of myself as a reflection artist. I can't mm. help it. I reflect I reflect about the past. I reflect about the now. I reflect about a coaching conversation. I'll reflect about individual coaching events. I'll reflect about last yesterday. What happened? I'll reflect about my family. I'll reflect about a conversation. Um, and and I, I journal. So part of my reflection. So where do I reflect? I mean, I reflect in my head, but journaling is something I've been doing for maybe 20 to 30 years actively. And the act Wait, of writing. Go ahead. Let, let, let go ahead, because many people here on the show already talked about journaling. Could you say in a few words, what is for you journaling? How do you do this? So for me, I have it's not to do lists. And it's not tactical. Remember, I talked about the tactical thing earlier. To me, it's strategic. It's dreaming. It's envisioning. Uh, it's what if. What if I approach this? Or journaling is, how. what if I tried this experiment today? I'm going to be coaching Eves today. What if I tried this experiment? Because yesterday, it didn't work out really. Everyone knows how Eves is. Mm -hmm. So I, it didn't work well. Why don't I, I wonder if I approached it this way. Or I might think about this competency or this stance or something. So to me, journaling is is more of a, I don't know, a brainstorming place, mm. uh, a what if place. Now sometimes but I'll written I, down. Yeah, or, or is but no, it's written. In. So I I do I do a fair amount of physical journaling on paper. I like paper, but I also have a, an app called a web app called Penzu which is a journaling app. And I, I sort of do maybe 50, 50 
Normally, my early ideas are on paper, and then I'll move them to electronic. Now, part of my journaling is my writing. So my writing process is related to my, so where do I get ideas to write? Uh, that mm. would be part of my journaling is capturing. Jerry, uh, Jerry Weinberg talked about field stones in his writing book. And it's kind right. of cap, capturing nuggets to write about. And, and I think of myself as capturing field stones as well in my journal. But that's the sort of things that I'm journaling about. And so what I hear, you, you said 50% is on paper and 50% is in, in the app. Is, is the app, the, is the reason for doing it in an app to indeed find the field stones that Jerry was talking about? Or is there a different way? No, it's, it's that. I think of it as a, ma a maturation process. It's very cloudy. So the paper mm. is the place where I, and for example, I'm not, a, I'm not good at drawing electronically. But I can draw with I can draw with a pencil or a pen, so I can capture things graphically on paper pretty easily. Uh, I'm not an artist, but I can capture an idea or draw a picture, and then that helps me formulate the idea. And then I'll move it to paper, and then I'll move. And when it you move it, when you ahead. move it, you you take a picture of it to keep the the, the drawing, or sometimes is that... sometimes or sometimes I just leave it there. I'll keep it. And then I'll just use that as a genesis for, for the next step. The next step, which is then more written out. And, yeah, um, yeah. Okay, but thanks thanks for sharing that because indeed, yeah, the journaling, it came up already. And, and sometimes I thought, okay, maybe I should ask a little more about how does that work for some people? Because it it's a technique. I, I think 20 years ago, uh, I, I read a lot about it. There was a lot of people talking about it. But these days, I, I hear practitioners like yourself talking about it, but I haven't seen it much written out. So it might be good to, to, to stress that a little bit. That um, it, It's a technique that helps a lot of people to, uh, what I would say, crystallize their own thoughts. Well, that, and, and that's really the key. It, like, again, do I have a, a personal agility tip? I don't even think of this as a personal agility tip. It is, but it's really, it's not the journaling. It's the act of reflecting. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the act. So we talk about retrospective. So maybe another way of framing it is personal, become a personal retrospective artist. Mm -hmm. Retro, retro everything. Retro a conversation. Retro, why aren't you? Uh, signing up for coaching. Why have you not read a book in, in a year? Or, or not, not in a judgmental way, but what, what's going on? Retro, retro your life, retro your profession, and think about things. Uh, interviews, Eves. Uh, part of my reflection, if I'm interviewing a client or if I'm interviewing someone for a role, um, I'll, or if I'm being interviewed, I'll reflect on very often nowadays, you don't get a lot of feedback from, I don't know about Europe, but here in the States, I think they call it ghosting or something. You don't get a lot of feedback. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I found that I can reflect on the conversations and I can generate some feedback based on my reflection. So really, I, I actually started and it, um, I, you make me wonder if it, it's related to the ghosting, but I've actually started during your interview, like let's say half, if I know there's still half an hour left or 15 minutes left, I'm actually asking the question, how is this going? And, and really asking to, if, if, what did I really ask for the feedback during the interview? Yep. And it has helped me already to, to, to correct some things. And sometimes both of us, we feel like, okay, this is going nowhere okay, let's not spend another half an hour. We both think that this is not going anywhere, that that's fine. Maybe we can rectify if we want, but if both of us, we feel no connection, that that's fine as well. But I've had moments that I felt like there's a real connection and somehow the other party didn't feel it or vice versa. Yep. And just having then five minutes to discuss it a little bit, what, oh, maybe you misunderstood when I answered this and let, let's go yep. into that and that, that. And that, yeah, it, it's, it's indeed that kind of thing, reflecting in the moment, getting uh, what I would call sometimes meta, going at meta on, on a conversation. Uh, I find that, and maybe it's indeed, like you said earlier on, age that we kind of think a little bit of it. It's not just a conversation. It's also thinking about the conversation and, and retroing kind of everything that we're, we're talking about. So that's... Um, I I've on its you. own, it's a good tip. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the one tip for me. I've sort of naturally fallen into it. I've gotten better at it over time. 
uh, again, the, it's it aligns with the journaling. Uh, I just it's what now I can overdo it. You can overanalyze. Oh yeah, all of us were good at that. <laughs> so so you have so it requires some balance, but but that's that's something that I've. It's it's probably again. I would liken it for me personally as a superpower or a real differentiator in my agile journey is my ability to self-reflect um, mm. in a variety of ways. It's really it's really helped me. And I would and I want to move on to the next question because I know we we need to watch time. But um, the 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 one thing I wanted to reply to the the overreacting or the overthinking. I think this is where. I have most use of an external coach because I'm already good at coaching myself, but when I'm overthinking, then it's good to have someone else who say, stop Eve, let's, let's not exaggerate. Let, let's go back yep. to the basics. And, and that is something that I haven't figured out myself there. I really need someone else. I and looking from your reaction that, that you seem to kind of recognize that. I would agree. Well, I mean, it's part of that reflection artist. It's not just itself. But it's also having the humility or the wherewithal to find a coach, to, mm. to ask someone to, to have a coach or coaches to help give you that insight. Absolutely. And be open to those insights. Right. Be, I, I talked once I wrote a blog post once about, you know, I, I think the most important part of coaching is to be coachable. Right. Oh, yeah. So to, to have a coachable mindset. And for me, reflection is a part of that. Um, is a is a big part of that. Yeah, it, it's in, in, insane the number of people who want to be a coach but who are not coachable themselves. And we can talk for hours about that. I know. So we'll open I, that part. I, I no, <laughs> just, I agree. It's, yeah, I think we recognize both of us. We recognize that, and also in ourselves, of course, there are moments Absolutely. that we're. Let's move to that next question. What have you learned about remote working? And you already talked a little bit about I, it. I think, I think I've, I've covered it. The big revelation for me was this, the, the ability to be effective mm. and, and being thankful for that part of COVID and that part of being a disruption in, in my, in our industry uh, mm. and how to work I, I attended a workshop by Dan Mizick. I don't know if you know Dan, but Dan... Yeah, I know Dan. Uh, wrote also some... I can't come up with the name, but he wrote a great book also. Uh, yeah. But, but Dan was... He did a... He just shared... He did a mini workshop on how to teach virtually. And he was talking about just his lessons it wasn't it was what was effective for him but he was getting he wasn't it wasn't even teaching from the back of the room or it wasn't even like murals and mirrors it was making human connection just like we're doing now it's mm. hand motions it's making eye contact it's having cameras on and it and i i attended that workshop before i converted my training to virtual training and when I said earlier, my training has equal to, if not better results, impact virtually, I, I give a lot of credit to Dan and the relationship. So he talks a lot about building relationships, not just between me as an instructor and, and students, but between the students themselves. And what do we do to, to be relationship builders? Uh, and, and, and I really saw that unfold. So for me, that goes back to working remotely. You can build, I've seen it. You can build relationships. It's not the same, but you can build effective relationships in virtual environments. Uh, and that's, that's something I've learned and I've gotten, and I've gotten better at doing that myself. It, it's for me one of the well, not main, but it's one of the reasons why I'm doing this this work, the the whole podcast series here, uh, because I want to show people that it's possible. Like I don't know, at least one third to half of the people I'm I'm interviewing I've never met before. Uh, we just exchange just one or two emails and then we get it. Okay, with you I had some interactions before, but there's a lot of other people that I've never met. And, and that we actually feel really connected, almost impossible to stop talking. Uh, and, and yeah, that's, that's the kind of thing um, I, I've say, have been saying for years is that 
if it, it's interesting, if I go to a conference to the States, for example, and if I have, if I leave and I have a good connection with my partner, I can leave for two, three weeks and I still am very much connected. If I leave and I have a very big fight before I leave, it's, it's horrible. And anything I would do remote is, is impossible. Then we can better just not talk for two weeks and then probably things will clear out. And right. so that's still something that is when, when the relations are already hard, it takes a lot more effort. And usually when I'm at the conference, I don't take that effort to do it with my partner. I, and that's something I needed to learn. Um, but creating a connection, again, we need to make the time for it. And usually when we see a lot of remote work, people don't take the time. Right. And and I think both of us, we're kind of playing with it. I don't know if you do it on purpose, but I think you do and I do it as well. Is that, okay, sometimes we lean into the camera and sometimes we go back. These are kind of ways of dealing with it and, and making sure that, oh, wait a minute, you said something interesting. Oh, and, and, and that's the kind of thing that Absolutely. is all possible. And again, the tools have been a lot better than 20 years ago. Uh, so it's, it's, it's not a coincidence. And of course, the tools, the, a lot of um, money was invested the last three years in making these tools a lot better. And I'm pretty sure that within 20 years, things will be completely different. Yep. Yep. Um, and at the same time, I also think you talked before about being a dinosaur. I know, for example, um, when I was growing up, I was maybe, well, I was calling my, my girlfriend at the time and we were spending an hour on the phone every day. And, and my children, like my daughter, my 15-year-old daughter, she would do, what, 10 seconds video breaks in the morning sending to friends all over the place where a lot of other people, 40 years old, they're like, I don't want to turn on my camera. Let's, let's not have a camera. And it's like, and, and the younger generation, they're just throwing away video all the time. It's like, yeah. in, instead of what... 20 years ago, people would text each other and they're like, no, no, I'm video chatting, very short. Thing. So that's a completely different way of dealing with media than, than, than we are. So again, a lot to learn, a lot that we can, can do there. Okay, let's, and, and like you said, you already said a lot about remote work. Let's talk about a book. What's a book that you wanted to talk about? So... There's several that I'm reading, like I said, and I, I'm not going to focus on a bunch. So I have a tendency, I, I read fantasy. I'm a fantasy junkie. So science fiction and fantasy. I like world building. I like dragons for some reason. And I like world building. And I like wizards uh, and good versus evil. And there's a book, there's a series I'm reading now, an eight book series called The Tree of Ages. So I just happen to be in the middle of it. I'm in book five of eight. So I'm I'm mm -hmm. over halfway there. For me, I'm, I read fantasy in, in parallel with something that's professional. So when I mm -hmm. said I read in parallel, it's not all professional books. I have fun books, escapism books, that allow me to, uh, I have a, a fairly active imagination, and it allows me to imagine worlds and to transport myself into the world to some degree. Mm -hmm. And the other thing with me is it, it energizes me so from a self-care perspective like at the end of a day at, at presenting workshops at agile one of the ways for me to recharge my batteries is to read a fantasy book for about an hour and i'm good to go mm. uh, so it, it really recharges my batteries so that's that's a series i'm reading there uh, so it's fun or or it's the imagination part and then a book that i'm reading is doug silsby has a book called presence-based coaching and, it, and I and, think that's the book, right? Yeah, that's the book. And and Doug, Doug, unfortunately, is no longer with us. He passed away a few years ago, but he has several books and he has this notion of presence based coaching or embodiment. So coaching mm -hmm. is not just words and it's not just mindset, but it's being aware of your coaching presence that it includes your body, like the self-awareness aspect of what's happening in your body, right? And what's happening in your client's body. So how are they, how is their stomach feeling? Uh, you know, meditation is a part of that. Uh, going through exercises is a part of the embodiment. And I'm about halfway through. I, I read it like you and I were talking about earlier. I read the book about six years ago, seven years ago, when Doug was still alive. Uh, not end to end, but almost end to end. And now I'm sampling it again. 
And I just, I just, and I'm investigating the reason I'm curious about it is I'm really going into coaching self mastery. So I'm into this notion of there's something called the agile coaching growth wheel, which I'm sort of passionate about. And in the middle of the growth wheel is self mastery or self awareness, or think of it as mindset, coaching mindset, coaching presence, uh, coaching self mastery and, and the self. So forget being skilled at outward coaching. What are you doing to become skilled at inward, <laughs> inward coaching of yourself? Mm -hmm. Not coaching, but awareness of yourself and how are you showing up? And Doug's work aligns really nicely with that. And it's not just up here, but it's like, how is your body reacting? There's this notion that trauma, for example, Eves, if you've had historical trauma, it's not just in your head, it can, sur it can surface in your body. Right. Yeah. So, it, it's, for, for example, uh, the, the thing that many people recognize, I'm really afraid of heights and it doesn't matter what. If you take me on a walk and there is a height, my body just freezes. And if I know, even if I'm somewhere where I know I'm 100 percent sure that I'm safe. Uh, yeah, it, it, I get very irrational. My wife gets crazy about it. But and I know and I get crazy after all these years, I get crazy about it. But I also know that, OK, it, it, it's there. Um, there are other things that you I, I, I could work on that. That's something I say, OK, I don't care that much to, to work on it. But that's that's a nice example of how trauma gets in in melting kind of ways in in our body and that, that react. And of course, people that have been in through traumatic. I'm actually working these days with people uh, from Ukraine and, and I'm, I'm very much aware about, OK, yep. they're living in a traumatic situation. Uh, and uh, yeah, it, it's it's something to be aware about and to think about. Okay, this is this is not a healthy situation that they're living in, and what can I do to make it yeah to make it as comfortable as possible? Because part of them they want to do the work, and it, in one yep. part people tell me it's insane, but it's like no, it's normal that they want the normal part of their life. They want to be part of, of society. They, of course, there is an economic part to, to bring in money, maybe for themselves, maybe for their country, but there is also a very emotional part of it. Okay, I want to be part of normal world and normal life. Yeah. And, and to, oh, yeah, that, that these are kind of things that are really important. And I want to stress, I want to bring it also uh, a few weeks back, I put, um, and of course, by the time this is published, it's a lot more weeks, but I published um, uh, an interview with Tasha, um, who's actually now work doing a lot of uh, bread working. So she's working with companies, Google and others, to actually help people to more uh, control their own bread and, and everything. So really, because, like, being much more aware of your own body which is, I think, is it's like, and, and there's a lot of, um, how would I say, fluffy things around it, but there's a lot of really important work that is there, there as well. The hard part is, of course, finding the difference between someone who just read a book and thinks he knows anything about it yep. and people who really understand it. Uh, but it, it is important. It is important. What uh, it, gives so you another, it gives you another hook for conversation, too. Mm. It's another... It's not just coaching a behavior. It's get, like it's a coaching conversation. And what happened in your body, right? And and so, for example, triggers, Eves, getting triggered in, you know, if I'm triggered in a meeting by something, well, what's happening in my body based on that trigger so that I can detect that earlier? And then maybe I can have a mitigation or something, or we can experiment with mitigations, or we can do go deeper than that and connect to like root root trauma or create those discussions. And it's not that I'm really client, the coaching client, you're just making them more aware of what's going on in their own body. It's not just up here in their head or their behavior, but in their body as well. And we can maybe guide them towards better outcomes or better self-awareness is maybe a, a better a better way to put it yeah but and i was thinking thinking about what you said earlier on about understanding yourself and of course the better you can listen to your own body you the better you understand some of that part exactly exactly so doug doug was a trailblazer uh and he has another book i forget the title on leadership so so 
you know, there's a coaching book. He talks about leadership skills. Uh, he's really a treasure. I don't think he's well known. He was from the mountains of North Carolina, believe it or not. Uh, and they still run classes out in the Appalachian Mountains. Uh, the, the folks that he trained, there's a cadre, a small cadre of folks. But this notion of embodiment in coaching, not just agile coaching, but in coaching in general is interesting to me not right now. So that's that's the books. Right. Um, let, uh, do we still have some time left? Because I know you, sure. you're... Okay. Sure. Uh, let's move to that. Uh, for me, one of the most interesting questions is that what is the question that you think I should also ask you and, and what's the answer? So I too came to mind for me hmm. uh, and I'll start with one. So do I have any regrets uh, was something that came to mind. Um, hmm. And I, I think the one for me is uh, I... I think I, I, I should have leaned in more. Um, I should have been, um, I, I'm, I sort of lacked self-confidence along mm. the way, or sometimes today people call it imposter syndrome or whatever, but I think I've had a bit of that. And in hindsight, I was like, you know, there were, there were jobs that I could have leaned in more. And all I'm saying is I could have leaned in more courageously. I could have leaned in more with more learning. I could have leaned in. I could have left earlier. I could have, mm -hmm. I could have, I could have, le I could have leaned in and left more. So lean in doesn't mean I, I I'm working right. Lean. I could have taken more action. Uh, what I've, what I regret time passes so quickly. Again, this is a dino. Everyone, this is a dinosaur's view to history. <laughs> so, so time in hindsight, it's like my gosh, thirty years went by in the blink of an eye uh, for me. And it's just, it's and you hear that everyone, everyone hears that from their grandparents and from their parents. But it's the truth. It's it's a true it's a truism. So. Uh, I, but you only see it at the age at the later age. You don't see that at twenty or. Well, maybe after a trauma or whatever, but if, if something big happens, but long life is something big as well. That's yeah. a little bit. And, yeah, so and live... I want to go ahead. I want to go ask a little bit. You 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 talked about regret, and before you also talked about that first marriage. Uh, you were really happy about what happened with your children or where they are now. Is there a regret there in that marriage? I, I don't know. I don't want to force you to answering that because maybe that's too too. Um, oh, I, too painful. I, I, but is there something there? I think for me, I mean, uh, we we did what a lot of people do. We tried to force the marriage, so we stayed together for the kids. If you ever heard that expression, mm, too right. long. Uh, so, but I, you know, I regret, I regret the events that led to that. I, I regret putting my children through that. Uh, that was a challenge for children. Divorce is a very messy situation i i would have probably regretted staying together too if we would have so i regret some of that uh i i try not to dwell in that so that's a that's happened long enough ago that i've sort of i have a peace i've <laughs> i'm at peace with that um mm -hmm. so not that but i think I, that's a little bit why i'm asking because when you talked about leaning in and and and, and leaving it's it's for me it's something similar like uh, well, i'm still happy married uh, it has their challenges like every marriage i would say but yep. but indeed um it, it's like how do you know at, at some point and 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 i hear that a lot from people who who uh got divorced that okay it's 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 painful and and how do you find and of course there is never the right moment but it, it's about making it also to the the cut the the less painful and that's very hard or almost impossible for most people i would say i uh, i think so i think the regret for me is and again it it unfolded the way it unfolded but my um, children were very young so i think divorce is difficult at any age but but it was very difficult for my children. Um, I mean, they grew up and they didn't know, they had a split household. They really didn't know what it was like. To this day, my kids really don't recall what it was like to have two parents mm. uh, together. Because uh, they were too young when you when you yeah, got divorced. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so staying together, some people stay together for the sake of the children, et cetera. And there is a continuity aspect to that that I can see. 
Uh, but at the same time, they maybe that would have staying together would be completely unhealthy, and that would have given a completely unhealthy worldview as well. So ab yeah, ab absolutely. I think the other part for me is that the regrets is, and again, I, I'm I'm proud of how much I've leaned in, but I could have done more. It's every day is precious, is and so so don't waste a day. Don't waste a day in your learning. I mean, if you want to walk in nature, you know, you want to go to the beach, that's fine. But in general, <laughs> don't don't waste days are precious. Uh, our privilege is precious. So l be present in that. each day and 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 do something wonderful in each day for yourself, for your family, for your clients, et cetera. So I could have leaned in a little bit more. Uh, the I, second... I, I, Go ahead. I, I want to, to, to stress a little bit because when indeed when you say lean in, it, it's also about some, I see some people that regret a certain situation and then dwell in it for years and years and years and not take any action in either direction. It doesn't matter if you leave or stay, but dwelling yourself in misery is the kind of thing I think so you're that's, talking about. That's, that's what I'm talking about, is take action and don't stay static. Um, so, so, and I could have done slightly better in that. The second one is, uh, the second question is what does the future, I had to put this in here, Eves, what does the future of Agile look like? Mm. So, mm, so, uh, and, and I don't want to go on a deep dive of despair, but it's not so good. I've been thinking about the future. So just like I think about my legacy, for some reason, I'm thinking about what is the future of Agile? Uh, whatever that means. And it I don't see us, I see a lot of fighting and arguing and judgment and focus on frameworks and a misalignment with basic principles and things. And I, so it's not a complaint. It's more of a, a, I'd like to, I'm hoping that we refocus back to the future. So what does the future of Agile look like? I hope it's a back to the future event and and, um, and did i did i hear also uh, i that you're hoping that we're focusing back on principles is that a little bit principles principles teams people uh mm -hmm. we talk about the world of work i'd like to have us focus on the world mm. uh, and the world of work if that makes sense so let's focus what you know oh what will agile do to make the world of work better well what can agile do to make the world better uh, and, and there are people in our community that are starting to to talk about that. And that's mm -hmm. agile can be a powerful disruptor. So so again, getting back to the basics, the principles, I, I, I'd say the manifesto, but I'm not arguing about things. Uh, scaling frameworks, do they really matter? I don't know. Uh, so it's and why why and be respectful. Uh, another thing that bothers me, is is folks are re they're picking on agile but we don't always respect i think of us as standing on the shoulders of giants mm. so schwaber sutherland mike cone the, there are giants there so for example safe is standing on the shoulders of giants i, I we need to acknowledge that we're standing like who's because that's not just <laughs> cast dispersions on the past uh, let's honor the past and then talk about the future. Let's be respectful. So I think we lost I, some of those aspects, and I'd like us to get back to back to that. I, I really like that uh, that that fact, and I'm I'm not kind of surprised by your answer. It, it, the interesting part is that, so like I said earlier on, this this video series is based on a book that I created ten years ago with more or less the same question. And this last question, what's the question that I should ask you? Ten years ago, people answered all over the place in all kinds of directions. And now, this time in the video series, I think people who are regular watchers will, will notice that I think half of the people, maybe more, are talking about what's the future Agile? Do we still Agile? What's Agile? And so that a lot of us were, were worried about it, thinking about it, thinking, and, and, and it goes in all that, the answers go in all that directions. But a lot more people think about it because we feel, I think, some kind of same energy around that. Like, oh, this is important. We need to, what I would say is, is 
um, respect that that legacy of agile and agility and, and and think about that so i think with a lot of us and and that is kind of also the answer that you're giving like let let's work around it let's let's face and let's look and respect you you call them the the people the giants that we're standing on and and, and it, it it's all kind of things for me it's also the community because Agile for me is is almost fully community based, not 100% true, but but it's a lot is is there in the community, and and for me this is why I'm doing who's agile, not just for the big giants, but also, I don't know the person that just discovered agile yesterday and that tomorrow will talk about it and 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 that will talk with you or with me on a stage in a couple of months or years and that we will all be blown away about and that's for me is is also why we we need to have that respect for for people in general i would say agreed so thanks for 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 bringing that up and it kind of brings me and i didn't realize it when i was saying that respect for people but it kind of brings me to that next question who do you think i should ask next what's a person or and i think you have a list of people or i have I, a, what you're I have a <laughs> So I have a list and I'm thinking diversity and I'm thinking women in agile. Uh, so I'm a little, uh, a little biased that way. So a new Gopal is someone that I, uh, I had her and in a leadership. I'm going, to, I'm going to try to bring her up. That's, uh, that's, that's, a, that's a new, uh, she, uh, I think is on the board of the Scrum Alliance. Now I met a new in, in Dallas, Texas in 2017. She attended a class, a leadership class with me. She's just wonderful. Uh, she has spearheaded a group in Africa and Nigeria that's teaching young women uh, and investing in young women in technology. Uh, she's one of those folks that put her money where her mouth is and walk her talk. Uh, Kemi Raji is a coach, a wonderful coach in Toronto. Is this Kemi, I think? Yep. Yep, that's Kemi. Again, a wonderful role model. She's involved not just in coaching, but she's involved in giving back. And then there's a new Smalley who's who's there. That and was Kate, this one. And Kate McGow. They're kind of partners. So if you interview, if you interview uh, a new, you probably want to interview them together. Uh, hmm. They they call themselves Cat cat new or something like that they have a concatenation of their names and they do a lot of co-presentations and um, uh, wait i didn't oh i seem to have lost a google okay that uh, I, I wanted to show cat as well but uh, somehow my uh, google spreadsheet so those says those those two want. would be dynamic uh, uh kate and anu are csts are trainers they're also mm -hmm. coaches. They're also involved in the community. All of these people are involved in the community. All of these people are walking their talk and are giving back. And I just, th those are some folks that came to mind. I don't know. Again, it's giving people a stage. Eves, mm -hmm. I was I was thinking if, if you haven't had them on, they would, they would be really great uh, people and, to talk with. And I just showed before the other person, but I still want to show the picture. I think this and is that's, Kate. And that's Kate. Absolutely. Just just to make sure that I also showed her because that was, was prepared. And yeah. indeed, uh, the last two women were on my list, but were not invited. The first two were invited and were, yeah, we didn't have time yet to schedule something uh, for, yeah, I think all of us were busy. I'll have lots of work. Yeah. And I think indeed the, the first two were, yeah, tremendously important in the Agile Alliance, I think, these days working really hard and and also working i think on well i think we're what this is the the 18th of july i think in a in a couple of uh, weeks there is the the agile conference so i think both of them are involved there as well so Absolutely. probably the recording will happen after that uh but yeah i'm trying both of them to have on my show for a while uh because like you say i'm i'm very um yeah blown away about what they're doing, how they're pushing it. Also, um, I would say presenting a mirror to, to the Agile Alliance to sometimes say like, okay, you've done all nice things, but there are so other people that need more attention, other yeah. people and the whole women in Agile, the whole Agile uh, in color 
organizations that I think both of them are active in and um, and putting back on on some of these things. So uh, really important indeed to to do that. Um, it's uh, yeah for me it's also one of the things I've seen in the agile community. I think in general women are more um, visible in the agile community than there are in the IT in, environment in general. Uh, but let's face it that uh, a lot of Agile has been a focus on the Western world and not that much on, on the other part of the world where Agile is rolling out. And for me, it feels like the new ideas might come much more out of these. Uh, we're talking about Agile and, okay, how can it help governmental and how, uh, what was it? There is a conversation I had this year with, with someone who said, okay, let's let's look on how Agile could help against uh, corruption and other kind of things. It's like, okay, this is completely outside software, so I'm not sure how it really applies. But they had ideas and was like, okay, some of the transparency can help in that kind of way. So it's, it's really interesting, the kind of conversations that um, we hope, or at least I can hope I can have with some of these people. I, I agree. I mean, and it's an amazing amount of new energy. A new, I'll, I'll speak for a new because mm -hmm. I know her more. I don't know how she has the energy and the time to do the phenomenal things. So she's doing things in Nigeria. She's on the board of the Scrum Alliance. I know she has a family with young children. She has, she works. She has a day job. And it's just, she's everywhere. And, and so mm -hmm. that's the generation I mean, it's ideas, but it's also passion. You talk about my passion. I have a drop of the passion that a new gold pound has. So the, this, these, this is the generation that's coming up. So I, they uh, give them a stage, and there's just some wonderful people. I, I agree there. I agree. Well, uh, Bob, it's been wonderful time talking to you. If people want to reach out to you, what could be a good way to, to connect with you? So LinkedIn, I'm on LinkedIn, just Bob Galen. And I think uh, that that's the link, if I'm correct. Yep. And then uh, I, there's a, I have a website that probably the best place. I have a, I have an alter ego, everyone, called the Agile Hyphen Moose. Uh, it's mm. a soapbox for me. Uh, I like moose. I collect little moose figurines. So this is a moose figurine here. I have them mm. on my desk. Uh, and uh, that's that's my branding for my semi-retirement path that we were talking about earlier. So I I like to think of myself as the Agile Moose. So that's a good place to uh, get to know me more, to reach out to me, to talk to me about coaching, uh, volunteering, whatever. Uh, just getting in touch with me, and I'll leave it at that. That's probably the best the best connection is Agile Hyphen Moose. I'm trying to uh, put it also on because I, I thought about it and then I forgot about it. So I think that's the link, right? Uh, uh, it's I it's just, it. so that's that's to get coaching, but agile-moose.com is the route. And then if you want to explore me coaching you in some way, so yes, that, that's, that's, the, that's the link. And that's I know I don't look like a moose, everyone, but you know, if I squint just the right way in the mirror, just the right way, I, I grow horns and I can maybe appear to be a moose. I actually learned, uh, just to, 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 to go into that, I just learned this year, and uh, as a Belgian, I, I have, there's, as far as I know, no moose in, in Belgium, but uh, they, I've learned this year that moose, they grow their horns every year. Is that Every is that year, similar? every year. Wow. And they're, they're huge, they're huge horns. They, yeah, that's they... why I thought this is grown yeah. after, 10 years? No, it's every year they grow again. And they grow larger as the moose matures, but you're, you're absolutely right. Every year. It, it, it's insane. I thought it would grow larger because after all these years it keeps growing, but it's no, it, no. it starts again. No. Wow. It, I know. <laughs> uh, in fact, people in Maine here in the U.S., Maine is a state, a northern state that has some moose, and people go out in the woods and collect them sometimes collect mm. loose horns that have dropped in the woods that, that are dropped in the woods oh that's interesting yeah, I, I, yeah. I, yeah. Eve's, and so again we learn all the time yeah, exactly trivia eves i from my heart thank you when i saw that you had invited me i'm i've been an admirer of yours and all your work 
and when I saw you invite me, it was an honor. And I was, I was and am super excited to talk to you. And you were just so gracious today. So thank you for having me. And I really well, appreciate the time. Thanks for, for taking that time to be here with me and to bring all your moose wisdom to, to the people <laughs> who are here. Uh, it, uh, it's been a wonderful time. And I, I think we both know that we can keep talking for another three years, uh, three hours, but we don't have that. I know you have a coaching call later on, but, but thanks for your time. And thank uh, you. Have keep, a, in keep in touch. Great evening. Have a great evening. Bye, everyone. Bye bye. Thank you for watching Who's Agile, where the stories of agilists come to life. I hope you liked today's interview. Subscribe if you're not subscribed and want to get to know other agilists.